Yes, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity tonight, Father, to hold up our dear friends, mm -hmm. spending the time with their family. Lord, we just bless them tonight. Yes, we Jesus. thank you, Father, that the Holy Spirit would be present in that gathering. Thank you, Father. Father, that the love of the Father would draw on. The, yes. Because that's how you drew every one of us. You didn't draw us through condemnation. You drew us, you didn't draw us through conviction before your great love and your mercy was demonstrated to us. We thank you, Lord. Kindness. We thank you, Lord, that you recognize that family is important. Father, you, you sp spent so much time in your word so-and-so begot so-and-so and just went down and recognized families. So Father, we just thank you, Lord, for being with this family tonight. And Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word be and the anointing of your word be released here tonight. Father, you said you sent your word to heal us and I receive healing. Father, where your word is released, demonic spirits cannot stay. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Lord, we just receive from your word tonight in Jesus' name. We love you and we thank you, Lord. Let us be tuned to hear and receive your word. And it may go deep and find a resting place and bring forth an abundant harvest. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, we love you and give you praise. We thank you. Amen. Amen. This is Jerry and Barbara Seymour. We, you have tuned in to see more in the word. In this session, we are studying, introducing, and moving through Acts chapter 20. So we encourage you to open your Bible and join with us. If you would like the notes to uh, next week's teaching, you can contact us on the YouTube or Facebook, and we will get you these notes to follow along with. and archive in your personal records and as we move through the book of acts you will have notes on practically every verse in that book <laughs> so it's amazing to think right mm -hmm. so <clears throat> barbara's going to start off and read uh, a section of acts chapter 20 and then uh, she will make her comment. Be a little comments. Mm -hmm. And then I will pick up and make comment on verse four. And then our dear brother Randy Link will follow up and conclude the class. So, so with your Bibles open, I will start reading in Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse one. And, what verse and I'm going to read all the way down to verse 12. So it'll be a lengthy reading. Um, and I'm reading out of the New King James. Mm -hmm. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now, when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece mm -hmm. and stayed there for three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia. Also, Aristocratus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and Tricurchus and Troph Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Taurus, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And in five days joined them at Taurus where we stayed for seven days. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Long winded. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in a window sat a certain young man named 
Oh shoot, it just slipped. I'm sorry. You you got uh Eutychus. Eutychus, thank you. Who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and fell on him and embraced him and said, do not trouble yourselves for his life is in him. Now, when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed and they brought the young man in alive and they were not a little comforted. Hallelujah. And then they went ahead to the ship and sailed to Assos, where they're intending to take Paul on board. So he had given orders intending himself to go on foot. So that's Acts 20, 1 through 13. I got hung up when I started doing my notes and work in the week and everything else just kind of got away from me but i got hung up on the first verse <laughs> <laughs> go figure right and paul called his disciples to himself embraced them and departed to go to macedonia you know the saying parting is such sweet sorrow it is sorrowful and it can be sweet but it is hard right in my life Growing up, childhood, until like 18 years of age, when I graduated from high school, I attended 10 different schools and 12 years of education. As an adult, I've moved four times and will probably move one more time before I'm laid to rest. All 14 of these moves were in different cities, different states, and even different continents. Saying goodbye to those people who enriched your life is a very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. And you truly do not know sometimes when you'll see them again. If ever. If ever. Yeah. Looking back over our adult life, I realized that when we left two of our resident cities, we gathered our friends around us, just like Paul did in verse one. Paul called his disciples together to himself embraced them, and then he departed. I believe this was not a short meeting. This took a while. He was hung up in the emotion. They were probably hung up in even greater emotion than probably what he was. After teaching for two years in the school of Tyrannus, there was more than 12 disciples here mm -hmm. because it had grown in those two years. A lot of people had believed there was two places that we lived in after Jerry and I got married that we did that very thing. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and Biloxi, Mississippi. We did not do it in Greenville, South Carolina. But in Baton Rouge and Biloxi, we still have people of long-term relationships, even though they were not the longest place of our residence. Right. But because we gathered them together, because... Mm -hmm. We had a time that we cried and we mourned. We said goodbye. When will we see you again? That kept that long-term relationship like a string. It just kept going. In Greenville, we didn't do that. And don't I? We thought about it, and we don't know why we didn't do it when we left Greenville, but we didn't. And we don't have those relationships in Greenville, even though we lived there the longest. So we got to learn something here from Paul. He's not just saying goodbye. He's saying, I want to see you again. Mm -hmm. You're so dear to me. Mm -hmm. I want to see you again. Mm -hmm. And who else did that? Jesus. Come on. Jesus gathered his disciples, those he loved to himself before he left the earth. And so we have two great examples here of how to say goodbye. Let's don't just pick up and leave. Let's just, if if you have to move, if you've ever moved, if you see a move in your future, don't just pick up and leave the area. Gather your friends around you, embrace them, and let them know that this is a sorrowful thing, but it is a God thing. Mm -hmm. And we know that we have to do this. And um, 
Jesus did it. He didn't know when he's coming back, but he's told his disciples, I'm not sure when, but I will return. Right. And in that, they were comforted. Mm -hmm. And I think that is true even with physical, natural relationships, mm -hmm. particularly if you were brothers and sisters in the Lord. Right, right. It is hard to say goodbye, but we know we will see you again. Right. And the, the accountability and the life uh, partners and the life friends that have been pillars in our lives came from the cities where we did this. Mm -hmm. So there's something to be said about having a going away party. That's right. Even if you got to throw it yourself. Even if you have to throw it yourself. Mm -hmm. So I got... I was going through here and I made it all the way to verse four and it's uh chapter uh, 38 verses. And I made it to verse four in my, uh, that's where I, I, I kind of bogged down and, and started really looking at this. And uh, each of us have a, a Bible there in front of us. Each of us realized that this Bible was inspired, if not dictated by the Holy Spirit, to men to write it. And it was canonized and it was approved. But I find myself at verse four, just wanting to skip over verse four because of all of these names. You ever been to a graveyard and looked and and red tombstones. Well, these names are canonized. These names were honored. These names are, are more than a name on a tombstone. These names are translated in more languages than any book that has ever been translated, and they are worthy of looking at. The, I mean, as, as Barbara uh, so eloquently read over them tonight, they're, they're difficult. So why am I so lazy to skip over this section simply because I can't pronounce the names? That's kind of silly. These names have history. These names are, are worth digging into. And oh, by the way, I left you, I left you a few. <laughs> I didn't do all the research for you. I, I did the research and they're worth digging into, but I didn't do it all for you. Last week, we, uh, week before last, we showed you how to dig into and how to do the research. And so let's look here. Verse four. And so Potter of Berea accompanied him. Articus, Secundus. Uh -huh. That's not how you say that. Aristicus. Aristocus. Aristocus and Secundus. Like aristocrat. Right. <clears throat> Secundus of Thessalon Thessalonian, of the Thessalonians, Gannus of Derby, Timothy. Tychurtus. Tychurtus. And, and Trophimus. 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 Of Asia. So, first guy. Sapotifer, Sapotifer was Sapater. Mm -hmm. So I did a little research and uh, Wikipedia comes up and, and recognize this guy. And it's, and in other translations, it gives his daddy's name. It says the son of P Y R R U S H U S H U S Parafus Parafus was from Berea. Now, we studied the guys from Berea. Berea was also in the area of Macedonia. And if you do a little research, you find out that here Luke recognizes him in the book of Acts. But Paul talks about Sapotiphar in Romans chapter 16, verse 21. This is twice this man is mentioned in the New Testament by different authors. See, that's significant. Mm -hmm. That's important. There's something going on here. So 
who was this guy and why is his daddy mentioned the son of mm -hmm. so so Potiphar was chosen to represent the Jewish believers at Berea. And we noticed that they were account, they were uh, noteworthy. They did research. They found out that the Bereans were uh, students, student and highly acclaimed. Uh, Luke recognizes and gives these congregation, this group here, great kudos, Acts chapter 17, verses uh, 10, 11, and 12. So from this elite congregation, Sopotiphar was chosen by this congregation to travel with Paul. They probably had to sponsor him they, and to represent them. And he actually carried the offering. From the Berean church to go to Jerusalem. Yes. yes. So he was trustworthy. He was trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Now, history tells us I, we mentioned his daddy, uh, Parifus, Parifus. History tells us that the Parifus family name was a ruling power in Macedonia just 100 years later. This family name was extremely influential, and it's noted in some of the other translations other than the, the New King James that he, they note his daddy and the family name, but history tells us that this family was a ruling power in Macedonia. Okay. Worth digging into. Christianity and the way was moving up in the classes. It wasn't just poor people. Okay. Let's look at the next one. Aristarchus. His name indicates that he was from the aristocratic class. Aristarchus was from, where does it say? It says he was from Thessalonica. Thessalonica. He was a Thessalonian. Now, if you do a little research, you find out that his, his name means the best or best ruler. This man enjoyed the finer things of life. He was from probably a wealthy, influential family, but he too was selected by the Thessalonian church to represent them, travel with Paul, and carry their offering with Paul to Jerusalem. Now, where did we hear this guy from? The Simply the previous chapter, this guy came and spoke at the riot, but the people in the riot recognized that he was a Jew and they shut him down. See, what was that? That was uh, 19. Uh, verse uh, 29. It starts talking about him. And anyway, so this was a notable man in the city of Ephesus that was traveling with Paul there, but he was originally from Thessalonica. After this occasion, we see that this man continued, after they made it to Jerusalem, this man continued to travel with Paul. He traveled, uh, he is mentioned in Thess uh Colossians chapter 4, he's mentioned in uh, Philemon chapter 1. This man was, uh, according to history, recognized as one of the 70 apostles uh, mentioned in the book of Luke. He was the bishop of the church in, in uh, Syria, Apremia, Syria. He stayed with Paul in the Roman prison. He accompanied Paul. He stayed with Paul. He was Paul's friend. He comforted Paul. He stayed with him. Wow. History tells us that he was martyred for his belief. 
Okay, so we, we've talked about two aristocrats. Let's talk about Secundus. Secundus is actually not a man's name. Secundus is a position. It means the second household slave, the second ranking slave in the house. It, we don't even know the man's name. But Paul goes on to mention house slaves. He mentions, uh, Luke mentions Secundus. Paul mentions Tertius. Mm -hmm. Tertius in Romans chapter 16, verse 22, which means the third class, the third position. He mentions Quantus in Romans chapter 16, verse 23. Which means the fourth. The fourth ranking house slave. We don't even know this man's name. Last, a couple of weeks ago, Barbara brought an interesting point to the table. She mentioned how the women in Paul's ministry were so influential and had such a part. He recognized, he uh, uh, gave them kudos. What's interesting here to me is that there is no rank in the way of Jesus Christ. We see the aristocrats. We see the slave. We see the common man. We see the women. We see all ranks of culture, of economics. Racism is not a thing in this. We... In this, these two men right here from Thessalonica, we have an aristocrat and a slave walking side by side, shoulder to shoulder. Mm -hmm. You know, that's so good. That's the way it's got to be. That's why Paul writes later in one of his epistles, don't go in sitting on the front row. Let someone usher you. Or show you the seat of honor. Don't just assume because you're aristocrat or whatever a, the name your your name might be. Sit back. Let someone else take oh, you and promote you. It also tells us that in the church and in the sight of God, the body of Christ, there is no rank. We are all equal in his sight. It's interesting that at the foot of the cross... Mm -hmm. The ground is level for every one of us. Amen. The ground is level. We have all come short of the glory of God. We all desperately need a savior and our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what I got out of one little verse. And I left you a couple of characters there to, to do some research and find out why are these guys mentioned? We, we already know about, Timothy and and Gaius, but these other two are are worth digging into. All right. Well, uh, Brother Randy wants to share from his point of view what is going on in Paul's life and validate this by other supporting scriptures. So, uh, Randy Link, we it's always a pleasure to have you uh, teach us, and you have the class. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. The um, the background, and I'm glad you said a little bit of it is subjective to what we uh, would have found because the there is no actual full history that gives us all of the details of how the weaving of this uh, uh, whole thing that God put together that we call the church, we get pieces of it and then it weaves together, and when you finish, you see the whole thing. Well, Luke wasn't necessarily concerned with Paul's emotional conversation. We don't hear it a whole lot when even when we get there uh, in verse 1, uh, that he encouraged them, and that he doesn't give us a lot about Paul's demeanor in relation to a lot of these things. But I think then that when we're looking at it and we're seeing the start to chapter 20, we realize that there's some things that just don't seem to add up. Because if you look at the map and you see where Ephesus is, it's on the uh, eastern side of the sea. 
on the western uh, coastline or near the coastline of Turkey. But it says that Paul then get, takes leave of these people. He, we know that he is determined to take an offering to the suffering Christians in Judea. And he wants to be there. We find out a little later, he wants to be there uh, about Pente Pentecost. So in effect, we're looking at a period here of about four or five months that he wants to prepare and be ready and be able to be there for. So instead of staying in Ephesus and enjoying the comfort of his friends, like Barbara was talking about, he decides, no, I need to do something else. And so we get from Luke that he leaves and he goes west. Now, this is kind of like leaving Memphis, going to Phoenix before you go to Atlanta. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, the airlines don't even set up flights like that. They're always looking to be flying into the sun as much as they can because the winds work best in their favor in that way. And so this whole thing, when you're reading it, like Jerry said last week, we need to look a little bit and think on what it is that we're reading when we grasp these things. Don't just quickly gloss over. So we get a picture by in Luke in about four verses here, five verses here of three months of Paul and his, um, the folks that are traveling with us, his entourage, as it were, we get a picture of about three months of their life right here in these verses, but we don't really know in between there, kind of like the rest of the story. So what we have to do is we have to overlay the events to understand. Now, uh, Barbara has said a couple of different times that the time they spent specifically in Ephesus was probably around um, 54 to 58 AD, somewhere along in there. They were there about three and a half years. They leave and they go back to Corinth. So if you remember the, the history, the second missionary journey that Paul takes started with Silas. They went, they went across Asia. They get to the coast and they get the Macedonian call. So then they go and they open into Greece, the gospel of Christ at Philippi, then through to Thessalonica. And then he goes south to uh, Athens and he ends up in Corinth and stays there for a little over two years. Develops an acquaintance, Aquila and Priscilla. And they then also become traveling partners with him. And they go then to... Jerusalem, and they go to Antioch, and then when he gets back to Antioch, he says, now it's time for me to go back on the missionary trail, and he goes to Ephesus. And so at Ephesus, he spends three years there. Well, and as we've said, he has tremendous uh, success in Ephesus. You know, today in our culture, you know, he would have that seven o'clock spot on all of the Christian networks. Everybody would want to have Paul there during this. I mean, he's got the whole following. In fact, it's everybody in Asia knew of the gospel because of the three years of teaching time that he did in Ephesus. So here's a guy who we ought to be sending an offering every month, and he's going to send us a prayer cloth, and we're going to be good. Well, during that last year, he gets a visit from some friends from Corinth, and they start telling him about things that are going on. Now, as you read through here, and I'm, I, I went very quickly and moved to that part, uh, to there, and that three months then, he actually gets this in that last year in Ephesus, he gets a concern that there's some things going on that aren't quite right in the church at Corinth. And so he pins during that last few months in Ephesus, he pins a letter. We call it 1 Corinthians. And in it, he addresses some of the things that he's heard that goes on. So if you, uh, mark in your Bible, 
Acts 20, because we're going to come back to it, but we're going to go over to basically 2 Corinthians. But I want to start first with the conversation of what he hears. Um, and he intends, when, you, when you're reading 1 Corinthians, the very first chapter in 1 Corinthians, verses 10 through 12 says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no division in the church, rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. Others, I'm a follower of Apollos. Others, I follow Peter. And finally, those that follow only Christ. So he sends this letter, and it has some very strong words about what are you guys doing? Have y'all lost it? And after the letter is read, then some in the fellowship now speak against Paul's authority to even address them. They make the claim that he doesn't have credentials. He doesn't have status among the other apostles. He doesn't have any riches. He has to work to make his own ministry. And so Paul determines I'm going to go and face off with these guys. And so he goes to Corinth, and he spends most of the three-month period in Greece at Corinth addressing this. And so after three months of contending with these people who were constantly bringing these, he then pins another letter as he's leaving to return to now to go to Jerusalem. The second letter is 2 Corinthians, and some believe that it is actually as many as three letters that have been combined together. Some believe it was written all together. I don't have the intellectual prowess to be able to tell you yay or nay, but I do know that it has some indications that there could have been other writings in his visit, but he addresses that. So let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And there we're going to read the first four verses quickly, and then we'll move down from it. It starts, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that's at Corinth with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia. Now, again, this is the southern half of Greece is Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That always sounds like a good way to greet, to greet somebody, wouldn't it? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings through Christ. We share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we've suffered. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Now, if you were counting, that's a whole bunch of comforts. He is wanting, and and the the tone that he wants to set was, I came in authority to the church, and you guys divided in the way you listened to it. Some of you said you accepted it. Some of you continued to reject it. Some of you are still in the middle going, what happened? Well, here, I want you to know that I'm going to write this other letter instead of coming and telling you, I think it's in chapter two, where he says, I'm writing this letter because I don't want to have another painful visit. He is saying, I have the uh, work and thought, and he's writing from the standpoint of a parent to children who need to hear they are loved. And so he takes the time to let them know. Now, he he adds something that's kind of interesting here, and if you really read it, I think it's the New King James that really, to me, made it come alive. But in verse 8, he says, I want you to know and don't be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. 
for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. I've known folks who have fought depression and fought it to the place that they thought it would be better if they died. Now, you could think that Paul is writing here to them about the problem with the riot at Ephesus. I think he's writing to say, no, when I heard the break in the church, it broke me down. And yet I still serve the church at Ephesus and nobody there knew. But I was breaking. I was broken. And I came to you and you rejected me. In fact, he's saying that because it indicates that during the time he was at Corinth, nobody asked him what happened in Ephesus. What's been going on with you, my friend, for the last three years? We hadn't seen you. They didn't get that friendly response. He got a cold shoulder, and he could not understand it. And he said, I want you to know that simply knowing what was going wrong in the church so depressed me that I could only be comforted by God. You get in the picture? The great man himself is saying, I love you so much that I'm broken that you can't even see it and understand it. Paul moves on to speak then about Christian leaders. I need to move quickly now, obviously. Um, but that tr true Christian leaders point others to Jesus, not for an earthly reward, but their eternal work. Verses 21 through 24, he goes on at verse 21, and it's God who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us and put his seal on us and gave us his spirit in our heart as a guarantee. But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrain from coming again. I'm not coming back because you guys, I, I, I might not be able to handle it. That said, he goes on, and uh, in chapter 2, he speaks that we're the Roman, chapter 2, verse 15, for we're the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death, to the other, a fragrance of life to life. Who's sufficient for these things? We aren't. Like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. He's, he's point blank is saying, we do not preach the word of God for an earthly reward. We don't preach for money. We preach with sincerity and God's authority. Now, these people understood the term sincerity. It's a word of, a, of a, those who do pottery. And fine pottery, then, if it has an air void as it's being made, it's called a sin. And it's because it's a place where that will break uh, easily. And so they would hold fine pottery up to, be, to a light to make sure it had no voids in it. If it did, it would be worth less. But he's saying, no, we don't have any voids in our life because Christ's authority is the one that gives it to us. He continues in chapter three, are we beginning to commend ourselves again or do we need a letter of recommendation? Remember Apollos, when he was leaving <clears throat> in chapter 18, when he was leaving Corinth to go to other places, he wanted a letter from Aquila to be able to say, we know who this man is. Paul's saying, I don't need a letter of recommendation because you are our letter of recommendation. It's written on your heart. It's not hanging on a wall somewhere. We're not read. You're a letter that Christ wrote and witnessed for us with ink for the spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, but tables on of human hearts. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. He answers the rejections of those that are crying against him because the Corinthian church is his letter. <clears throat> the proof of his authority is written in the spirit. He's referring to Jeremiah 
31 and Ezekiel 36 for the power and authority of the spirit that worked in these prophets to give them authority to bring the word. He goes on then in this section to compare the work of the Old Testament, which showed the glory of God on one man's face, Moses, but it wasn't profitable to the redemption of the Gentiles. We call Paul the uh, the apostle to the Gentiles, but that's incorrect. What we ought to call Paul is the chosen vessel of Jesus Christ, because that was the term that Jesus used for him. He said, he is my chosen vessel to take the gospel of salvation to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And so uh, we see Paul working that way to bring that new covenant that Jesus can save, and he does it with a door that's opened in mercy and grace to all that would hear. He continues and he weaves through this first seven chapters of the book of 2 Corinthians. He weaves something that we're going to call the paradox of the cross. The paradox of the cross is that a God of all creation loved the creator or loved the creation so much that he gave his own life. And then the father of that creator then raised him from the dead. The cross then becomes a place that determines the life that goes forward. The cross is the place that God provided salvation from that Jesus died to give it. It shows the character of the love of God and the sincerity of it, that God gave himself to redeem us. And it also then becomes a place for us to make a choice. We give our life and we take his in return. I have now become a new creation in Christ, Paul would write. And because of it, that crucified life becomes imitating of the suffering of Christ. And because of it, I am to you, Corinthian church, the imitator of Christ in bringing the gospel, he says. But only by my poverty and my surrendering is the example because I do it to serve you. Do you think they were kind of getting a message by now? So he then adds one place of rebuke. He adds the chapters eight and nine, and he speaks of the need of an offering to assist those that are hurting in the fellowship. I know some of you here, I know you give gifts to help in missions work and in the work that is going on from the fellowships you're in. He was saying, you guys forgot to do that. Y'all were more tore up with whose group camp you were in rather than being in unity to be able to have an offering to help suffering friends. He goes on then. Um, and he uh, continues in, sec in chapter 8, verse 9, he comes in and he says, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that his by his poverty he might make you rich. That he's talking about an inheritance that can't be bought or gotten except through Christ and is given to him to remind him of. To be a Christian is to be led by Holy Spirit in generosity. Sometimes it's a spontaneous generosity. Sometimes there's a plan for the generosity. And sometimes there's a sacrifice to do the generosity. Holy Spirit, grow us into the image of Christ. Chapter 10, he addresses in gracious words the things that others have said about him. He's talking about his friends that talked about him here, those that grasp it. Not that he proclaimed, like other men, his own greatness. But it, then he kind of changes the tone a little bit. When you get to chapter 11, now you get the authority of the apostle talking. Because in chapter 11, he begins by comparing his record to what he calls in the translation in the ESV is super apostles. These other men who are here telling you they know what's what. Indeed, verse 5 in chapter 11, indeed, I consider that I'm not in the least inferior 
to any of these super apostles. He goes on his argument. They think they're Jewish Bible experts. Guess what? I'm a Pharisee. I've been from birth being taught and learned the word. I memorize the Torah. You don't believe it? Read my writings. You'll find in there reference after reference after reference where I am quoting scripture because I know it, not up here, but in here, and it comes out as I speak. I know what the prophet said, and it's of their word that I can determine and, and to explain and uh, argue who Jesus Christ is, that he is Messiah. I They say they know about Jesus. I've spent time with Jesus. I went in the wilderness and had three years with him. And in doing so, I was taken to a heavenly throne room. And I've seen things that no man is allowed to see and live. And yet God gave gave it to me that I might be able to bring it to you. I had a vision on my way to Damascus that completely changed who I am. I am now a servant of the living Christ. These other men require money for their ministry. I gave my life for you as a mission of Christ. I worked that others would not be a burden to you. Paul has taken now a position of You think you got something? Let me tell you about the real truth and see if you stack up. He's already told them in chapter six, the things that he's endured. He then goes into chapter seven, but and closes six with the confirmation of who we each one are. And he turns around and says, because of those promises that God has called us, let us change and live in a different way. Here in chapter 11, he's saying, you're following the wrong dudes. You've made the mistake. In chapter 11, he gives his resume and he finishes it though with verse 30 and 31. If I must boast, I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. You know, all that other stuff, that and a dollar 59, I buy a cup of coffee. That's what he was saying. Because all that other is in the past, I'm more worried about where we are today and where we're going. And what I want to know is, if I boast, I'm going to boast in Christ. I'm going to boast how weak I am because God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is worthy of eternal praise, knows I'm not lying. The apostle is bold in his word. He then in chapter 12 speaks of the heavenly vision and having now a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. My power works best in my weakness in verse 9. I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so the power of Christ can work through me. It's not me, but him. This past weekend, I was in a circumstance where I was praying for folks and had a different circumstance that had my mind going a whole different direction. All I could do Saturday morning before I went to the session was to say, God, I can't do this. You better be praying. And I had more men have an anointed work Saturday morning than the 12 I prayed for Friday night because I was kind of mixing it in there, I guess, Friday night. But Saturday morning, I had nothing to give but what Christ did. And these men were moved. Paul saying, without Christ, I am empty. I can't do this. And we don't have the relationship. He then in chapter 13, he brings some questions and he's really asking them, hey, have you guys forgotten? Are you really followers of Jesus? Are you followers of somebody else? Have you rejected Jesus's salvation? And he gives them a very sober warning, verses five through nine. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you fail the test of genuine faith. As you test yourselves, I hope you will recognize that we have not failed the test of our apostolic authority. We pray to God that you will not do what is wrong by refusing this correction. I hope we won't need to demonstrate our authority when we come. Do the right thing before we come, even if it makes it look like we fail to demonstrate our authority. For we cannot oppose the truth 
but we must always stand for the truth. Truth as a name is Jesus. We are glad to seem weak if it helps show that you're actually strong. We pray that you'll become mature, grown up, grown up in Christ. Then his final greetings, finally rejoice. Aim for the restoration. Comfort one another. Listen to this appeal and agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of Holy Spirit be with you all. Paul says, I carry greetings from all three members of the Trinity, and I love you guys still. Now, let's look back at chapter 20, verse 13. We got about two minutes. Verse 13 in chapter 20. I've got the New Living Translation. It says, Paul went by land to Asos, where he had arranged for us to join him, and we went on ahead by ship. This verse sets up the entire rest of the book of Acts in the study that we'll be looking at over the next few weeks. This verse, isn't it profound? This distance between Troas and Asos on a map is about 60 miles. You go about 30 miles one way and 20 miles the other way, but it's all mountainous. Realistically, they say you could do it in two short days. Paul probably took as many as three because it's hard to walk up and down those mountains. Uh, but he sent everybody else by a boat. They went around. It was not, you know, just a one-day little trip by boat. And he said, you wait for me till I get there. Why did Paul wish to go alone? There's a part of what are we what are we reading when we're reading it? Mm -hmm. That's good. Come on. He, he went by land because he wanted to spend time with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He didn't want to talk to anybody. He didn't want to see it. It's not unknown to a lot of you that Jerry and Rex on Saturday afternoon spend time together in prayer at the intercessors meeting at their church. Every week, two of them, everybody knows you got a need. Those two guys are going to be over there to pray for me. But every once in a while, Jerry or Rex says, hey, I got to get up and go to the corner by myself. I need to have a little talk with Jesus. I need to tell him all of my troubles. And he's going to hear and he's going to answer. That's what Paul needed. You see, he was still worried, concerned, troubled. And he pins this letter and he has to say, Jesus, have I missed it? I've spent two months, fight, two months fighting with these folks for them to get it. And now I'm having to write this. And it really got me all messed up. Help me, Jesus. And so. He needed that. But what happened during that walk shapes the rest of Paul's life because he goes from being the man that we read about in 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, the one in depression that's ready to have suicide be a better choice, to a man that we boldly can see what happens as he has this closing visit now with his friends at Ephesus again and I'm sure Barb and Jerry will pick it up next week. But if we look down then into verse 22, you'll say that he's saying, now I'm going to Jerusalem, drawn there irresistibly by the Holy Spirit, not knowing what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit told me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. Come on. We're going to hear the same thing three other times where Holy Spirit is telling fellowships each time that Paul is going to be arrested in Jerusalem. And they're going to say, Paul, don't go. And Paul's going to say, you're breaking my heart because it's the will of God that I go there. 
It's his purpose for me that I might speak before kings and Gentiles and Jews. That's who I am. And if I die there, I die there. It's God's will. I'm resigned to it. It's good. We're good. And it's going to break the heart of these Christians that know who he is. It shapes the remainder of his life. What he found was what he writes to his son Timothy later, that godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment. It's a word that is defined as being at peace with truth. Truth has a name. It's Jesus. Paul said, my contentment is in Christ. And because of it, I can be comforted even though I know what kind of is coming. I don't have to worry about it. In fact, I lay aside all this other stuff that I might be content and godly before you, my friends. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to break bread tonight. We ask that you add the wine, Lord, to make it justified by each one and understood that when we take the Lord's Supper, that we take your death and burial and a reminder of the sustaining of life in everything by the bread of life. Help us this night, Lord, to take your word, to meditate on it, and let it be written on our heart, our mind, and our very future defined by the word. His name is Jesus Christ alone. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Be glorified this night. Amen. 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 Randy and I had talked about this uh, discussion, and after about 20 minutes into the discussion, <clears throat> I told him, Randy, I can't, I can't regurgitate this. I can't teach this the way that you have just taken me through in 20 minutes. So, Randy, we sincerely appreciate your perspective on this, and I believe the research is accurate. I believe that the, the timeline that you have place to put the letters to the Corinthians, Paul's response that we see mm -hmm. and his, his walking alone in fellowship, uninterrupted conversation is with the Holy spirit, with Jesus is it's irreplaceable. We, we have to have time alone with Christ. We have to have time alone with Holy spirit and just to recognize how this shaped his life from then on is I, I, I think it's totally uh, understandable. And, uh, certainly, I don't I wouldn't find anyone anyone that would argue that this is what was going on in Paul's life on this occasion. So we sincerely thank you for for sharing your thoughts with us this evening. <clears throat> It was great. Yes. It was, to it was very enlightening. Very, very enlightening. What I love of connecting the scriptures together. So right. thank, thank you, Randy. And that's the value of reading the whole Bible. Yes. It's the value of reading completely through your Bible and understanding the, the author and how it, how they all, as uh, Ms. Joy says, connecting the dots is just, uh, it just makes it so so much more real and so valuable to us to see what's going on in these people's lives. Mm -hmm. So we love you. We love every one of you. We thank you for joining us tonight. And if you want the notes, uh, contact us and we'll share these notes with you so you can have them and follow along as the teaching is going along. This has been Seymour in the Word, and we love you, and we thank you. We're here every Thursday at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and we'll see you next week.